Justice and Poetry, Dante's Book of the Dead. These three lectures on uh, Dante center on his sense of the Bible as the prime model and source of his poem. Anyone who knows anything uh, about Dante and the Divine Comedy, a poem that was finished roughly 1320, it seems a very long time ago to us today, uh, knows that, knows that uh, he is the uh, Christian poet, or at least the Catholic poet. You might get some people who would want to make uh, that distinction. Uh, his, his poem is uh, evidently so rooted uh, in the texts of the scriptures, the Hebrew and the Christian scriptures, uh, that uh, it is uh, the safest argument uh, one could make uh, to claim uh, that he is a deeply religious poet and that his poem functions uh, with a clear and keen sense of uh, the words and concepts of the Bible. Uh, so I'm on the side of the angels uh, in making uh, that opening uh, statement. Uh, but I, I don't wish to talk about uh, this situation in, in generalities, uh, but rather as highly specifically uh, as I can. And I will be arguing for three different passages uh, in the comedy uh, that in each case uh, they are crucially informed uh, by readings of the scripture which for one reason or another uh, have remained either uh, not seen by us or only opaquely glimpsed. Uh, that there is an excruciatingly important exchange being carried on between the text of the poem and the scriptural text uh, which once we see it uh, begins to open up our understanding uh, of the poem uh, itself. Uh, the three texts that I wish to approach are first, in, in, in this particular lecture, uh, a rather uh, unimportant, at least seemingly unimportant, and not very inviting passage from the 29th Canto of the Inferno. Then, uh, in the second lecture, uh, I propose to uh, consider one of the most famous scenes in the entire poem, uh, the first half of the 33rd canto, in which Count Ugolino uh, rec recounts his uh, misadventure uh, in uh, the uh, prison in Pisa, into which he and his four offspring are cast by his enemies and in which uh, they die. Uh, and then uh, in the third lecture, I would like to consider uh, the rather astounding series of things that occur in the first two cantos of the Purgatory, in which Dante lays out a new poetic terrain, uh, a terrain that has not been visited uh, in poems before him, while in the Inferno he is only going to a place that had already been visited by, for instance, his guide Virgil. So that's the overall plan uh, for uh, the three lectures. Now, behind each of them, uh, lies a perception of Dante's revolutionary adaptation of biblical exegetical methods to the construction of his unique kind of fiction. Now, it is unique at least in this. Uh, it is a fiction that all of us know is not true, and yet which complains over and over again is literally true. And I'm not talking now about a spiritual significance the poem might have, but its actual physical significance. That is, the poem is presented with some insistence by Dante uh, as though it had actually transpired, as though he had actually taken this seven-day journey to the afterworld. Uh, it is a ridiculously dangerous thing for him to have done. Uh, only a madman or a genius uh, would have taken so large a chance because he knows that any one of us picking up his text and reading that claim will say, balderdash, this man made this poem up, and I refuse to believe that he did anything but that. There have been very few, and there have been a few, but there have been very few who have taken the truth claim made by the comedy at face value. Others, uh, perhaps more intelligently, uh, have tried to understand why anyone would have done so mad a thing. Why would Dante have made such a uh, immediately unacceptable claim that calls such terrible attention to the risk taken by the poet? Why did he do that? I hope in the course of the remarks in this first lecture uh, to have something to say about that subject. It may be subsumed under the heading of allegory. That is, this whole subject 
uh, may be construed well uh, as being a distinction between two kinds or involving a distinction between two kinds of allegory. Uh, the allegory of the theologians and the allegory of the poets. Now, this is not a lecture about that. You may all thank your happy stars. Uh, but uh, if you do know about that distinction, uh, you may want to bring it to bear as you think uh, about the problem uh, presented in the verses that we are going to examine. Dante, it seems to me, uh, and to many another scholar, uh, has placed his poem in the tradition of the allegory of the theologians. This is absolutely improper. Uh, and if you read the ground rules, read them, for instance, as they're put forward by St. Thomas, most brilliantly, I think, by St. Thomas, but he's not the only one to talk about the allegory of the theologians. He says absolutely specifically that there's no way in which any human agent may write that way. God alone can write in a way that needs to be understood via the allegory of the theologians. To human agents, there is only one kind of poetry. It's called the allegory of the poets, an allegory which resides in fiction, while the allegory of the theologians, and this is for people who haven't studied the question before, surprisingly, perhaps, because we tend to associate allegory with fictiveness, the allegory of the theologians exists in facts and in the relation among facts. That is, as simply as I can and as briefly as I can, a way of understanding this, the distinction, which, if operant here, uh, is so crucial to our understanding. Another way of understanding it and doing away with the whole question for practical purposes and uh, simply moving into the issue is to say that in Dante's adaptation of this way of thinking about allegory, uh, what counts is history. That Dante presents his poem as though it were history, as though it had actually occurred, and ties it to other historical events, other historical texts, most notably, perhaps, uh, the Bible itself. Now, that vexed question of uh, whether a poem can consider itself to be history is something uh, that we will see is presented to us almost immediately once we get uh, to this passage uh, in Inferno 29, which I'll read to you when we get there. But uh, not that fast. Uh, I would like uh, to try to set up some introductory uh, material before we do approach the offending text. Uh, the title of this lecture is Justice and Poetry, Dante's Book of the Dead. That will, the meaning of that will become clear, I think, uh, in, in a while. In practice, it is a search for a sufficient gloss, uh, a very unmodern uh, term, a sufficient gloss, the notion that one can understand something uh, completely uh, and enough uh, is one that's gone from modern hermeneutics, but it's one that operated uh, for uh, people like Dante. And trying to uh, establish that sufficient gloss uh, for what looks like an easy passage and turns out to be a hard one uh, involves us in looking at one of the least spectacular passages in the poem. It cannot be defended on aesthetic grounds, at least not immediately. Uh, it's not dignified by having a major figure, uh, which is one of the things that people like best about Dante. It has so many major figures in it, absolutely memorable beings. Uh, none of that it will be true in the passage we're looking at. At Princeton, where I teach, I sometimes play a, a game uh, with students, especially in, in great books courses where we're doing, uh, you know, this, it's Tuesday, it must be Don Quixote, uh, those rapid reads through uh, the uh, major works in, in Western literature. And one of the techniques I found helpful in preceptorial small group discussions of those texts is as we begin uh, our, our time together, I will ask them uh, to give us a one-word lecture. Uh, this is a very happy concept. It's a, a dangerous one for a lecturer to refer to, and I wonder how many people right now are uh, wishing that I had given my one-word lecture. Uh, there's a certain relief in the very thought. Uh, the one-word lecture that uh, we've developed over the years uh, for Dante, the one that I like best, is one that also works rather well for uh, this particular uh, passage in the poem, which, in which the word occurs. My one, if I have only one word uh, to give a lecture on Dante with, uh, that word would be justice. I think I can make a case for it. I'm not going to make all of it uh, here in, in this particular setting. Uh, the word does appear in our passage, as we will see. 
It appears 34 other times. It appears 35 times in all in the poem, uh, once in Latin, 34 uh, in Italian. More about justice shortly. Uh, another introductory remark. The exegetical tradition and this poem. We have never in the West, and perhaps this is true for the world, uh, had a poem which had as much commentary uh, as, as this one. It's unheard of. Uh, Dante was barely dead before people began writing commentary about him. I mean barely dead. Uh, the commentaries poured out in the early 1400s, the 1320s, uh, and we were getting major commentaries at least at the rate of one every ten years. We have all together, uh, perhaps, and it depends uh, what you call worthy of being called a commentary. There are some which are really a little better uh, than some scratchings at the, at the bottom of the page. Uh, but uh, there are probably on the order of 150 to 250 commentaries that if you were really studying the poem carefully, uh, you would want to take a look at. Uh, that's horrifying. Had I known that before I fell in love with Dante, uh, I, I would have found someone else to fall in love with. Uh, there's just too much to do. The basic bibliography of, uh, in Dante studies, and we're now talking about bibliography devoted to Dante, not to the ancillary areas, which is just about everything in medieval civilization. But if you're just reading Dante, the basic bibliography is about 50,000 items. It's not right, but it exists. It is that way. Uh, he commanded that kind of respect. Uh, it, it tells you something about the nature of the poem. Uh, that it immediately drew that kind of intense word-by-word -word, uh, response, that great a commentary tradition. There is, for those of you who are online, and I guess everyone in the world almost is online these days, uh, there is a database that's situated at, at Dartmouth College called the Dartmouth Dante Project, which has currently, I think it's 44 uh, commentaries online and will, one of these years, not very far from now, uh, distant time from now, uh, will be up to about 60 uh, commentaries, and then we'll be able to add to that. And it's a very nice way of being able to get at a commentary tradition online, and it's fun uh, to work with. Now, when I was first involved uh, with the Dartmouth Dante Project, uh, some friends of mine, more naive than they should have been, thought that what I was doing was putting up uh, a lot of commentaries uh, so that we could dial in for answers, as it were. Uh, that, that's how we would use the, the database. In fact, what commentary traditions really do well uh, is not give you answers, but give you questions. Uh, they're fascinating to watch. Uh, watching them when they become agitated is instructive. When they don't like something, uh, why don't they like it? Because Dante is touching a nerve. Uh, and if you can find uh, commentaries saying this is a mistake, Dante, uh, maybe a scribal error here. Uh, whenever things like that happen, look out. There's probably something happening in the text of the poem uh, that deserves very close notice. Uh, the other thing that they will do, and here's where I love to watch them, it's sort of like you know, canoeing and you're watching the surface of the water uh, ahead of you. You can tell a lot by what's going on. There's sometimes a paradoxical relationship between stillness on top and, and things underneath. Uh, when you get stillness on top of the water uh, in, in a commentary tradition, what's very uh, likely going on is they're not getting it. That is, their silence uh, is because they haven't understood that Dante's playing a very significant game with them, uh, and uh, they're letting something escape that we want to investigate. Uh, and there's a certain amount of that uh, that we'll be able to see in the passage we're looking at uh, tonight.